good evening everyone uh, a warm welcome to one more cci webinar today and we are doing something which is different something which is novel today we are going to talk to you about the use of cryo in respiratory medicine so we are trying to talk to you about an intervention but an intervention which encompasses a lot of different procedures where it is used and hopefully you will have some insight as to positioning this cryotherapy in your patients in pulmonology that's what the aim is today uh, i've got a very elite panel a very young panel so excepting myself a very young panel people who use cryo in day to day clinical practice who do it day in and day out and we will have a panel post a short talk from myself and then from chetan i will introduce my panel after i have done my talk and chetan has done his and we'll take things forward from there so that's the plan for today we'll try and finish by 9:30 keep your questions coming in if you if you have any questions to ask please put them in the box and ask them as we go along and we'll try and answer them in between also at the very end so let me now try and share slides um grand so that's my topic today and i have got an introduction which is a traditional introduction from a 2016 paper which is more or less when i personally started doing cryo and you can see that how the introduction is designed is actually different to how we use cryo today so it says that we use it in the management of central airway obstruction which is true the fact that it does palliation in malignant airways disease the fact that it's mastered easily quickly it's safe inexpensive is something which is also true however thereafter you see that it says that maximal effect takes a number of days to happen and that ablation of early malignant disease in airways early detection by autofluorescence bronchoscopy followed by ablation by cryo is one of its uses so remember i said this is a meta analysis and then a review which was published in 2016 and i'll talk you through how things have changed since then and it's no longer uh, a procedure where maximal effects take a long time to happen so the three areas where i'm going to lay a lot of emphasis on well the two areas where i'm going to lay a lot of emphasis on is cryo debulking and cryo biopsies and i'll talk about cryo biopsies in various forms chetan is going to talk to you about ebus nodal cryo biopsy after i'm done so that's what is on the anvil today so that's the equipment in front of you and you can see that there are two major parts to it one is the cylinder along with the actuator and then you have the pro the actuator contains gas the cylinder contains gas and we are talking about two different types of gases and we'll come back to this again later on we're talking about carbon dioxide and nitrogen oxide so that's what the gases entail and the probes come in three different sizes so you see two uh, uh, sizes on that slide however there are three different sizes a 2.4 a 1.9 and the newest which is a 1.1 mm probe so 2.4 1.9 and a 1.1 mm probe the way cryo uh, happens and this is for the beginners is that you apply the probe to the tissue on which you want to freeze the temperature at the tip where the ice ball forms goes up to minus 90 in some cases up to minus 70 degree centigrade the gas at the tip expands due to the sudden drop of temperature and hence the ice ball sticks to the tissue in question you can see two diagrams there i hope you can see my cursor on there you can see this is a cryo probe with a water ice ball at the tip and then you have the ice ball but stuck to it is a little bit of tissue so those are the tip the gas at the tip expanding due to sudden drop of temperature and pressure is how a cryo probe acts let's take you through certain scenarios quickly because we'll discuss much more of this as we go along in the panel so this is a 40 year old man 
who has complained of a dry cough since the last six months. He's been treated as asthma. He was put on inhalers and he did not improve. He does not have fever. There's no weight loss. There's no hemoptysis. And he's seen multiple physicians and pulmonologists, multiple as in about six. And since the last 10 days, he could not lie down flat. And he's presented to us with Stridon. Now, before I show you a video in a moment, try and appreciate the trachea on there. You can see my cursor, hopefully. You can see the trachea tracking down. And on that, you see the compression of the trachea, just beside which you have a paratracheal opacity, a paratracheal mass. So you sort of know what to expect when you go down and do a bronchoscopy on this individual. I hope the video shows up. That's the CT in front of you. And you can see the large paratracheal mass. You can see the trachea reduced to a chink. And you know why this gentleman has stridor. This is the barrel of a rigid bronchoscope going down. And we'll talk later on as to whether a rigid is compulsory or you can also do it with a flexible. We'll come to that in the panel discussion. But you can see the barrel of the rigid going down. And then you will see that this external compression is no longer just an external compression, but it's infiltrated through the airway and the wall contains an infiltrated tissue in the way of a tumor. So that's cryotherapy for you. That's cryobiopsy for you. The procedure finished off with a stent being placed. The patient got symptomatically better. The stridor went away and the histology in this patient showed Hodgkin's lymphoma. So that's one way of using cryo. This is a different scenario, a different case, a scenario in which cryo is probably used the most today. This is a patient with interstitial lung disease, diffuse parenchymal lung disease. The pattern that you see in front of you is a fibrotic NSIP pattern. So you can see the CT, the mediastinal and the lung window. We will not spend a lot of time on this. It was decided because we couldn't get histology, we couldn't get a diagnosis based on the CT, that we would do a transbronchial cryobiopsy in this patient. So you can see the, let me run this video again for you before we come back to the remaining slides. So you can see the Fogarty catheter being positioned in here within the airway, the cryobiopsy being done, the Fogarty catheter being deployed. You can see how the Fogarty has been inflated and is in position. You keep it inflated for a period of three to five minutes and then you deflate and you see whether there's a little bit of oozing or much more bleeding. If there's more bleeding, then you inflate the Fogarty again and keep it in position till the bleeding stops and then you go down and take another specimen. So I'll come back to this in slightly greater detail in the subsequent slides. But this particular individual who had the transbronchial biopsy came up with a fibrotic pattern of NSIP, which was cellular. So that's the second use, a transbronchial cryobiopsy. And that's the use which people talk about the most or is done in most centers across the country. I want to show you a cartoon about how you go about doing this. And this is how you would do it with a flexible scope as opposed to a rigid scope. So this is, so think of this as being an endotracheal tube or an LMA. And you can see that you've positioned the balloon just beyond the tube into the segment. Imagine this is the segment from which you would take the cryobiopsy. The, the cryoprobe goes in through the bronchoscope. You can see that on there. And then you take your biopsy, freeze, pull, and then inflate and position the Fogarty or the balloon in position and take the biopsy. You saw, saw how the balloon remains inflated for a while. Make sure that the bleeding has been stopped. And thereafter, you would do the procedure all over again. So that's the procedure um, in gist. So you would sedate the patient deeply or you would give them general anesthesia. They would, however, be breathing spontaneously. This has described it through the rigid. I have done it both ways and I find the rigid to be safer rather than doing it through the flexible. But if you don't do rigid, it shouldn't stop you from doing cryobiopsies. The Fogarty balloon that we spoke about, the fluoroscopic control, which we, which we did not speak about, 
and there are centers in the country which do it without fluoroscopic control but again my advice would be to always use a fluoroscope it reduces the chances of a pneumothorax significantly the fact that you need to be about 1 cm away 10 mm away from the chest wall and the fact that larger the size of the probe less the time you give for the ice wall to form so if you are using a 2.4 mm probe you would wait for about 4 to 6 seconds if you're using a 1.9 it would be 7 to 8 seconds if it's a 1.1 you might want to use it for a little longer so this is the international guideline this is a very recent paper well recent as in 4 years old which looks at transbronchial cryobiopsies for the diagnosis of diffuse parenchymal lung disease and i will show you a couple of suggestions from the international working group so we talked about deep sedation or general anesthesia we talked about the fogarty balloon or the endobronchial blocker fluoroscopic guidance always you see is what's been said in this particular guideline it should be trained centers with an experience of doing transbronchial cryobiopsies centers which have a large population of patients with ild full anesthetic support emergency procedure can be managed in the way of hemoptysis being managed tension pneumothorax being managed and icu which is equipped accordingly and data should be preserved for a prospective registry so that's this international work group and i think it encapsulates what you need to do in these patients from which part of the lung would you you would do it and i think this is something which is important you don't want to be doing it towards the center so you see the inner red circle the one which is the thicker red circle you wouldn't want to do it from within this because if you did your risk of bleeding would be high you wouldn't want to do it from the outer red circle or just beneath it because the risk of pneumothorax there would be higher hence you would be 1 cm away 1 cm away from the chest wall or the subpleural region that's the area where you get the most yield and you would also get a diagnosis for diseases which are subpleural for instance a uip patient so the two important risks that you think about in these individuals the reason you need good training to do this procedure is the risk of bleeding and the risk of bleeding is somewhere around 6 to 7% if you look at the meta analysis and the risk of pneumothorax which is somewhere between 15 to 20% based on the meta analysis which was published in 2016 the last 5 minutes let me take you quickly through a couple of more cases this is a 37 year old farmer dry cough for the last 2 months the recent dyspnea worsened over 10 days with a reduced appetite can barely walk a few steps you found breath sounds being reduced at the right lower side of the chest and there was a right sided pleural effusion the pleural effusion shows up on the ultrasound that you see there this patient has a thoracoscopy has thoracoscopic biopsies but you use a cryoprobe to do the thoracoscopic biopsy now just to say that studies have shown that while you get bigger chunks of tissue when you use a cryoprobe to do thoracoscopy it does not actually increase the diagnostic yield however in malignancies etc where you want to do molecular analysis the extra tissue always comes in useful for these patients so for this particular patient thankfully it was not a malignancy the histopathology in this case turned out to be tuberculosis i'll skip this because i know chetan is going to do a case which is similar to this So let me go to the next one. This is a 66-year-old male, hypertensive, COVID in uh, April 2021, which was during the second wave. They received treatment with a BLBLI, methylprednisolone, bevacizumab, and the patient had no oxygen requirement. Came to us later on with a history of fever, cough, and progressive breathlessness and chest pain. Vitals were stable. The patient was tachypneic. was requiring oxygen 2 liter saturations of 94% and i've shown you one cut of the hrct and you see this centrally located lesion along with the collapse of the left lower lobe this patient i'll show you the so again you see the cryo being deployed there you see this white fungating looking lesion and you see it's very easy to take the tissue out on here so this was sent for histology and for microbiology the specimen showed budding yeast cells with pseudo hyphae pas positive galactoman and high so no doubt about the diagnosis here this patient had grown aspergillus and you can see the cast on there 
which is consistent with the fungal infection we spoke about. The sputum also grew Klebsiella in this particular individual. So remember, this is three months post-COVID. This is an elderly gentleman. I'll run the uh, video while we speak. We did very recently, this is about five days ago, large central mass, uh, very necrotic looking lesion, lots of water content, which is why you can see tissue coming out very easily with the cryoprobe. And here debulking is easy, large water content, soft tissue, friable tissue, easy to do cryo. This is a different patient and this is a wrong patient for doing a cryo. You can see a very smooth lobulated outline. This water content here is very low and it's very difficult to take tissue like this outside because the water content is low and this is a very solid lesion and hence cryo is difficult here. You would rather use a snare in these patients rather than using cryo for these individuals. Um, I started off by speaking about freeze and throw, about the fact that cryo can also be used for stenotic lesions. You form small ice balls in the, in the submucosal tissue. These ice balls melt and when they melt, tissue overlying it sloughs out. And hence, Cryo was first used to try and open up stenotic lesions, especially post-TB stenotic lesions. I'm going through this quickly because this is not something that we do anymore. So use of spheric necrosis within the tissue, toxicity of the underlying cells and tissue, sloughing out of the tissue, which resulted in restoration of the patency of the overlying tissue. And you can see the underlying tissue, which is frozen on there. The last indication that I wanted to mention was, again, one of the first indications for doing cryo in clinical studies was identification of early malignant lesions by autofluorescence. You could also do with this with NBI. You can see the small red lesion on my probe on there, and you would ablate this tissue by the use of cryo. So I'll finish off there and I'll hand over to Chetan. We've spoken about various modalities that can be used with cryo. We started off with speaking about uh, use of cryo for biopsies of various description. We talked about transbronchial biopsies. We talked about thoracoscopic biopsies. We talked about endobronchial biopsies, etc. We talked about the use of spheric necrosis in restoration of the patency of um, stenotic lesions. We talked about early lung cancer and ablation of tumor in early lung cancer by the means of cryo. And we spoke about the use of cryo in transbronchial, uh, in needle biopsies, EBUS needle biopsies with the use of cryo, which is what Chetan will speak about now. So over to Chetan. Um, A very good evening, everyone. At the outset, I thank Chess Council of India for giving me this opportunity. And I also thank Dr. Rajadar sir for the kind introduction and also sharing his valuable inputs on utility of cryoprobe in interventional pulmonology. Over the next few minutes, I would be discussing about this novel technique of endobronchial ultrasound guided mediastinal lymph nodal cryopyopsy. As you all know, EBUS TBNA has marked uh, its place in the diagnosis of mediastinal lymph nodes. And the diagnostic yield of EBUS TBNA from mediastinal lymph nodes ranges from 66 to 89 percent. EBUS TBNA retrieves limited amount of tissue that might be insufficient to allow for a confident diagnosis of rare tumors or benign mediastinal diseases, which frequently requires histologic rather than cytologic samples. So this novel method of transbronchial cryobiopsy aims to provide bronchoscopically obtained larger specimen samples from mediastinal lymph nodes. So this technique was first uh, reported in 2019 by Zingzang, and they reported a primary mediastinal seminoma achieved by transbronchial mediastinal cryobiopsy. And since then, there's emerging data about efficacy and safety of this uh, procedure from all over the world. And I'm glad there's significant contribution from our Indian uh, interventional pulmonologists. So this is the equipment that we use at our center. We use a Olympus EBUS scope and a flex uh, Vigisort 19G flex needle uh, for the conventional TBNA. 
and a 1.1 mm cryoprobe. Let me show you a video of how we do it. So you should uh, localize your lymph node as just like you do with uh, conventional tBNA. After you visualize your lymph node, do a conventional tBNA pass. Here we use a 19 gauze needle because it is a wide bore needle and it creates a better tract for the 1.1 mm cryoprobe to go in. We do a 10 to 15 revolutions just like our conventional tBNA needle. Then we draw the needle and uh, do the uh, rapid onsite evaluation. Fix the EBUS scope there, pass the 1.1 mm cryoprobe through the scope uh, and then this is the tip of the cryoprobe seen within the node. Activate for it for 3 to 5 seconds and then remove the probe and block with the scope and then the tissue is thawed in saline and transferred to formalin for histopathological examination. This is one uh, way of doing a cryolymph nodal biopsy. I'll also show you another way of doing a cryolymph nodal biopsy. This is a video that I've taken from my senior colleague, Dr. Harikishan. So this video shows how to do a cryolymph nodal biopsy using a electrosurgery knife. As usual, you localize your lymph node through the endobronchial ultrasound. This is the electrosurgical knife that is used to create a port for the entry of the cryoprobe into the lymph node. Here they pass the 22 gauze needle through that port into the lymph node to create a better tract for the 1.1 mm cryoprobe to enter the lymph node. Here you can see they're doing the revolutions with the conventional uh, 22 gauze needle. The needle is then withdrawn and through the same port, you introduce your uh, 1.1 mm cryoprobe. So the needle is here through the port, which is being withdrawn. And this is the 1.1 mm cryoprobe that has gone into the lymph node. You can see the tip of the cryoprobe within the lymph node. It is activated for three to five seconds. And then the cryoprobe is removed and blocked with the scope here. You can see the cryoprobe and the tissue at the tip, which is then thawed in saline and uh, transferred to formal. Then the tissue looks like this. You get very good size samples with cryonodal biopsy. And the pathologist is the most happiest person looking at these samples when you uh, get it in EBUS. So what are the advantages of cryolymph node biopsy? First is the larger size of the biopsy that is obtained. Lack of crush artifacts when you compare it with uh, forceps biopsy. There is better diagnostic yield. The material is adequate for ancillary studies. You can do all your molecular studies and next generation sequencing studies. And there is documented safety of the procedure. The disadvantage of this procedure are there's a need for an artificial airway as the scope needs to be removed and blocked with the cryoprobe multiple times. The procedural time is increased because you, do, you have to do a conventional TBNA followed by your uh, cryobiopsy. Samples obtained from a single area of the node because you create just one track and you have to go only through that track. So you'll be able to sample only one part of the lymph node. And there is need of additional tools and expertise for performing the procedure. And also it comes with an increased cost. So this is one uh, original article that we have published recently from our institute in uh, Journal of Bronchology and Intervention Pulmonology uh, on endobronchial ultrasound guided mediastinal lymph nodal cryobiopsy in patients with non-diagnostic or inadequate rapid onset evaluation. And we concluded that when performed in cases with a non-diagnostic rose, that is on conventional TBNA, it has a diagnostic yield of 59.3% and addit additive diagnostic yield of 43.7%. The tissue obtained by EBUS mediastinal cryobiopsy is adequate for ancillary molecular and microbiologic studies. And EBUS mediastinal cryobiopsy also has an acceptable safety profile with the most common complication being minor self-limiting bleed in 29% of cases in our report. And we also looked into the data that has been published on the same technique. And if you can look at this uh, area, this is the diagnostic yield of EBUS mediastinal cryobiopsy, and this is significantly better when compared with diagnostic yield of EBUS TBNA. And these are the reported complications. And this is the algorithm that we use at our center, and this is the algorithm that we proposed. EBUS TBNA for undiagnosed mediastinal lymphadenopathy, then you do a rapid onset evaluation by a pulmonary cytopathologist. If it is diagnostic and adequate, you take additional three TBNA passes for cell block preparation. 
If the rose is non-diagnostic or inadequate, then we go for EBUS guided mediastinal cryobiopsy. If that is diagnostic, we stop there. And if that is non-diagnostic, we go for di diagnostic mediastinoscopy. The reported complications so far in the literature are minor bleeding, pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, and none of these are fatal. So apparently it is a, a very safe procedure that can be done with good training. Thank you. Let me start off with the panel discussion. There's a lot of things that was said in my talk said in Chetan's talk, which we are going to go into in much greater detail. Let me now introduce the panel. So I, have, I haven't introduced anyone yet. So quick round of introduction. Um, my name is Dr. Rajadhar. I am a pulmonologist working in Kolkata. A lot of the slides that I showed, the especially the recording of the slides have been done by my colleague, Dr. Shyam Krishnan, who works with me and heads our interventional pulmonology unit. So thank you to Shyam for having shared the slides. Um, we have youngsters, young pulmonologists, interventionists from throughout the country. We'll start off with Dr. Vijay Kumar Chennam Chetty, who is from Hyderabad, uh, no stranger to CCI, the heart of CCI. Uh, Dr. Samir Arbat, who is from Nagpur. You heard Dr. Chetan Rao Vajapalli from Hyderabad. There's Dr. Balaraju T, uh, who's creating waves in the field of interventional pulmonology from WISAG. And then we've got our young colleague, Dr. Anirudh Saini from Jaipur. So I'll, let me start off with Vijay. Um, Vijay, we, I briefly discussed about the science of cryo. Um, I wanted to, you to talk us through how cryo came into being, into pulmonology. We all know it's a recent phenomenon, but how we borrowed it, what specialty has used it in the past, how we have started adopting it as a part of our practice. Tell us a little bit about the journey briefly, and then we'll take things forward about the physiology and the science of it. Vijay, you're on mute. Um, thank you, uh, CCA, for having me here. Thank you, Rajabai, for that wonderful talk. And uh, Chetan for uh, uh, really, you know, uh, excellent videos and presentation. So, uh, to, to uh, the very basic of uh, cryo has been, you know, uh, clearly mentioned by Dr. Rajadar. Uh, but having said this, the various other fields also use in, uh, uh, in uh, cryosurgical methods um, in the medical field. But to be honest, by okay, I was uh, trying to look at the literature. Okay, I could not get into the history of uh, uh, of uh, where we have borrowed this technique. Generally, wherever we borrow, generally we borrow from the gastro units. But I'm I'm not sure about you know where exactly we got this uh, cryotherapy into respiratory medicine. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I think it is, you're right. We have actually got it from our gastro colleagues. I don't know whether Bala, Bala, you have any thoughts? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think so if you look at the cryo unit, so what we are using now is the cryo 2 unit. So that is spe uh, <clears throat> specifically designed for pulmonology. So if you look at the previous unit, that's the cryo, the basic cryo unit. So that was not designed for pulmonology. It's basically designed for ENT and gynec and for dermatology. Sure. So this was used for uh, cervical lesions, uh, uh, for chronic cervicitis, for all those diseases. They used to do a cryotherapy in uh, uh, gynec disease and also for ENT. They used to do a rigid bronchoscopy, cryo extraction, uh, debulking with a rigid cryo probe using a rigid bronchoscope with the same unit. So if you look at how it started, it started from the other departments and they later introduced this flexible cryo unit for the cryo unit. So once that was introduced and they see they have seen there is a potentiality in this for uh, diffuse laparenchyma lung disease at, the, at what you said, sir. So then they have designed this new unit that's a cryo 2 unit. So that is specifically designed for pulmonology. So this unit cannot be used for other specialties sure. because it is dedicated unit for pulmonology. Yeah, sure. And that's why the one of the first concepts that were used was the freeze and throw, yes. which is the concept that you had for cervical biopsies, etc. Yes, exactly. so that's how we borrowed that. And then we came on to cryobiopsies, debulking and so on and so forth. Um, I'll come to you, Samir. Samir, um, we know that one of the reasons why 
cryo has become so popular is the so-called safety of the technique. We feel it's a safe technique. So tell us a little bit about uh, why it's deemed to be safe, uh, why it does not cause the same damage to cartilages, etc., as other procedures for endoluminal procedures. Samir. So very good evening, sir. Hope I'm audible. Loud and clear. Yes. So uh, coming to your question, so there are two ways of looking at it. Uh, one is uh, why is the procedure term to be safe? So when we talk about cryosensitivity, so there are different tissues which are cryosensitive and there are certain tissues which are cryoresistant. So in theory, the cryoprobe is sensitive to your, is resistant to your cartilage basically. So the cartilage is not something that your cryoprobe will stick on to. And one major worry on theoretical basis is any kind of perforation that we might cause when we perform a cryo extraction. So that is where uh, by theory and by principle, the cryo will not cause damage to your cartilage. Although when it comes to performing the procedure, I would say uh, it's, it's a misnomer if we say that it's a completely safe procedure. We have guidelines. We have guidelines from the Indian Chess Society. We have guidelines from various uh, other global publications wherein certain precautions, precautionary measures need to be followed to make cryobiopsy a very safe procedure, which basically starts with either deep sedation or general anesthesia followed with an artificial airway. So an artificial airway helps us in multiple ways. The first is whenever you're performing a cryo, you are pulling out the cryoprobe with the target tissue and you do not do not want to touch the vocal cords. So this is where an artificial airway will actually help you prevent any contact with the vocal cords. Second is the artificial airway will actually help you in getting bigger chunks out. And third is whenever you are performing uh, through an artificial airway, you are actually putting the patient under sedation or general anesthesia, which means that the possibility of cuff is decreased, thus improving the yield and decreasing the chances of bleeding. But all in all, the procedure is safe only if you are using general anesthesia or deep sedation using an artificial airway in which my opinion should always be the rigid bronchoscope because of the wider lumen, you have to have to always use a balloon, a Fogarty balloon or an endobronchial blocker, which will help in tamponade. And last but not the least is you need good experience because there have been centers where if the cryo procedure goes wrong and if there's an unfavorable outcome, which can even uh, we, we can consider the possibility of death of the patient on the table itself. So the the cryo unit or the uh, cryo services have been stalled for a very long time. So it's not right to say that it's a safe procedure, but uh, we need to follow all the precautions that have been put down now uh, by the various guidelines. Yeah, sure, Samir. I love the way you explain now. Uh, Samir, I've seen you for a while. So I think your position as the spokesperson, the media person for ECBAP is well justified. So that's very nicely put. Love the way you spoke. I think when we speak about safety here, we are speaking about two different buckets. The first bucket is what you started off speaking with, which is the cryo-resistant tissue. And thankfully, in pulmonology, the tissues that you want the cryo to be resistant to are the tissues which are cryo-resistant. And the ones, the mucosa, the high water content tissue, which is what you want to take out, is what is cryosensitive, which is the safety part. And then when you're using it and deploying it in various different areas, be it for debulking, be it for transbronchial cryobiopsies, etc., the adverse effects, the side effects gradually keep creeping. Um, um, Samir, I think you probably unmuted. Um, and that's why we sort of are hearing an echo. Yeah, grand. Thank you. Let me come to Anirudh. Anirudh, the question for you, um, three sizes, I mentioned briefly, three different sizes of cryoprobes available today. Bala also alluded to that when he started speaking. So what are the three probes and why do we need probes of three different sizes in the ambit of all the different procedures that we discussed during the talk? Uh, in my experience, uh, actually, I have used only that uh, 1.9 mm probe. Sure. Uh, I have not uh, I have not uh, experience of using the 2.4 mm probe or the latest sure. 1.9 mm probe. But uh, what uh, I uh, acquired uh, as per well knowledge and observation is that for the this uh, EBUS guided uh, mediastinal cryobiopsy, 
that 1.1 mm probe is the most useful one and uh, uh, recently in jaipur in jaipur first case has been done in the ck billa hospital unit itself of this epus guided mediastinal uh, uh, cryobiopsy uh, by dr rakesh bhuda and they have used this the same 1.1 mm probe and so it's safer for and safer and it's uh, more convenient to reach into the lymph nodes uh, mediastinal lymph nodes and uh, 1.9 mm probe uh, we have been using uh, and it is uh, a uh, it's uh, like effectiveness is that uh, it's uh, advantage that it can reach up to uh, 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 more peripheral area in the lung and uh, even in obese patients when uh, sometimes uh, when the we find the airways are narrow and uh, it can go up to deeper uh, places and uh, 2.4 mm probe that we i uh, i don't have any experience about that and <laughs> and uh, i think uh, i would uh, leave that question to you that uh, where is it uh, its utility where it lies its utility and sure uh, yeah thanks anirudh i think that's very nicely described so you spoke about two different scenarios you spoke about the 1.1 and the 1.9 Yes, I'll try and summarize the use. I can see Samir's hand, so let Samir speak, and then I'll try and summarize what my thinking is about the three probes. Samir, yeah. So basically, now there has been a shift. So what we are getting right now, what is available, is the second generation of probes, which are basically single-use disposable probes. So now there is a difference. Now we have the one point one, one point seven, and two point four. so these are the three sizes the reason for this is that the us fda says that you cannot reuse any uh, machine which is not non autoclavable so these probes were non autoclavable so the company stopped producing reusable probes and now what we have is basically a single use probe you are lucky if you bought a reusable probe before th- this came into action because you can use it for the next 100 cases also but right now we have only the 1.1 1.7 and the 2.4 single use probe advantage obviously uh, varies in the sizing so if you are going inside the lymph node a 1.1 is what can pass through the channel of an ebusco but otherwise what is uh, understood is for a debulking procedure wherein you require to target a larger tissue at uh, within less time is where the 2.4 is applicable and for your normal uh, transbronchial lung cryobiopsies in Uh, interstitial lung diseases where 1.9 does your job uh, pretty well so the only difference right now is all the probes have now been single use uh, they come at a lesser cost but they new they need to be disposed of and the 1.1 has uh, a either the use for lymph nodes or you can use a sheath with the 1.1 probe which basically does not warrant the need to remove the bronchoscope outside thus you can keep your scope inside take a biopsy control your bleeding have your vision it does not turn into a blind procedure when you come out you are still inside in still cold saline and then go again inside so that is the advantage of the 1.1 pro only disadvantage being is the size that you get is relatively small but it is definitely much better in architecture and size than the forceps biopsy right So Samir one question before we sort of uh, try and summarize this are you using the disposable probes Yes right now I don't have the new the older probes I only have the disposable okay. So so I have to put up my hand and say that if I had to use the disposable probes I probably would never have learned doing cryo I think it would be sort of prohibitively expensive I don't know about the rest on this panel but I think very few centers actually would manage to afford using a disposable probe in, in India today I, I mean I am fortunate enough to have two cryo units and a reusable, uh, a couple of reusable probes that are still with me. And I think it will be difficult for the developing world to actually use disposable probes unless we start preparing them locally at a much much cheaper cost. In so my, we, we are facing a very big problem that the company has a monopoly on this sure. particular uh, sure. modality. Sure. Sure. Um, I saw Vijay's hand in passing, but uh, Vijay, did you put your hand up, or was I just seeing things? Yeah, go on. Uh, uh, just to uh, uh, reiterate, uh, it depends on a lot of you know how we uh, coordinate with our pathologists, uh, because many times, many times uh, our pathologists are also comfortable. Initially, we thought that only one point nine mm uh, lung biopsy specimens would be really ideal. They can give the diagnosis. 
but we have had a, in the past probably four to six months we are using quite often 1.1 as well but uh, to be honest 1.1 also we are reusing okay so uh, it is giving good amount of you know tissue so, reasonably good amount of tissue so that our uh, pathologist can arrive at the diagnosis that's what i want to say uh, so no absolutely vijay so in my understanding i'll tell you my experience with the 1.1 i actually find the 1.1 quite floppy you know it doesn't have the stiffness of the 1.9 or the 2.4 and i find it actually a bit of a challenge to use it to do transbronchial cryobiopsy so i mean there's a head to head trial as you know between a 1.9 and a 1.1 and it says like you said vijay that the yield is apparently similar but maybe it's my learning curve that when i'm using the 1.1 the yield of tissue that i get is far lesser as compared to what i get out of a 1.9 so in my understanding the 2.4 is for debulking as um, anirudh said i would use that for central tumors debulking with a rigid i think it gives excellent result the 1.9 i would use for most other things like taking mucosal biopsies like taking transbronchial biopsies for a thoracoscopic uh, cryobiopsy i would probably use a 2.4 or a 1.9 i don't think it makes a lot of difference and i would use the 1.1 at the moment only for the mediastinal lymph node biopsy sort of in my practice i've tried doing the transbronchial cryobiopsies and hope with the 1.1 and i hope i'll learn better but i am still learning with the 1.1 yes vijay one quick comment uh, rajabai what yeah. i did notice practi practically is of yeah. late for the past one to uh, one and a half year we stopped using uh, um cm for doing lung biopsies okay right. and we don't have uh, to be honest we don't have uh, um, uh, any pneumothorax uh, breaks in the past close to around one and a half year but what i did notice is this being very thin 1.1 has a propensity to instead of giving resistance it can give give yeah. rise to yeah. penetration of visceral pleura because it just goes and hits the visceral pleura and then can give a leak that's practically probably one point which we should yeah. be considering uh, while doing lung biopsies yeah. probably we should do it under pleuro guidance if we want to use pleuro yeah I mean, if we want to yeah. use 1.1 Yes, yeah, so I always use fluoro. So one quick question: I'll come to you, Bala, in a moment. Why did you give up on using the fluoro, Vijay? Ah, uh, uh, it's uh, as you rightly said, by okay, it's about learning curve. So right. once uh, when we went to this uh, Guangzhou for uh, further training of you know what are the latest procedures, they're not at all. They're never using a uh, 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 fluoro, and then they're completing the. Uh, Uh, procedure within twenty minutes, taking four to five bits in twenty oh. minutes. That's what. Yeah. Okay. Exposure. Yeah. Bala, your comment. Yeah. So just wanted to say, tell to the audience because so we are very lucky. We have the reusable probe. So let us think if you are buying the new unit now, so you are not going to get a reusable probe. So it's always a disposable probe. So I feel the major drawback of the disposable probe is doesn't have a guide. So what is a guide means? It doesn't have a marking at the tip of the probe. Yeah. So if you look at the reusable probe, there is a one centimeter mark. One, two, three, four, five. So you have five centimeter mark for the uh, reusable probe, whereas this is missing in the uh, disposable probe. Even it for two point four, one point seven, or one point one. And this is a major drawback. I feel the personally the reason I'll tell you because what Vijay was explaining was he stopped using a CM, but I won't be comfortable using us uh, without using a CM. The reason is this. because if you use a disposable probe and you're not using a cm you literally have no idea till where you have gone so at least if you are using a disposable probe that's what gonzo people do when i was there at least so they use a disposable probe and they have this marking they just don't cross that 5 cm mark so if you cross the 5 cm let us think some most of the segments what you target is something like 8 9 or uh, middle lobe or something like that so most of the commonest segments for diffuse parenchyma and lung disease is the 8 9 or middle lobe so if you do in this segments and if you have crossed that 5 cm you have to be very careful that you are almost touching the pleura so this is a blind this is a blind rule so if you are using a disposable probe and this is where the challenge is so disposable probe doesn't have a marking and if you are not using a cm you literally don't know where you are there and i feel vijay is very very experienced there is no problem because he has done hunting number of cases so he knows that how is that giveaway feel 
And one more main drawback, what I felt with 1.1 probe, and this is a very stiff probe. Unlike the reusable probe, this doesn't bend. This is very strict, uh, stiff. In fact, what happens, I feel it penetrates the parenchyma than going through the bronchus. That's what I feel because I especially have seen this in the upper lobes. So in the upper lobes, this 1.1 is of no use, I feel, because it doesn't take, take the good curve like what uh, 1.9 1, 1 used to take, the reusable probe I'm talking about. So this is what the two differences I felt using a 1.1. So I've absolutely given away doing 1.1 uh, cryo lung biopsies uh, for diffuse parenchymal lung diseases. So I'm happy with the reusable probe, still it is functioning. So once it's gone, there is no way that uh, you can get a re reusable probe. You have to go and use a disposable probe. That's what I wanted to share. Yeah, no, fantastic. So I think one point that Bala makes, important carry home message for the audiences, the people who want to do cryo, the ones who have started doing them, is that do use a fluoro. With a lot of experience, you will probably learn how to do it without a fluoro. But I think the important thing is take your time doesn't matter if you're taking 40 minutes rather than 20, but try and be safe as far as possible. Safety matters. And I think safety does increase when you're using a fluoro, especially with your initial procedures and your learning curve. I think that's very important. Yes, Vijay. One important, uh, yeah. Bala did said very rightly, I stopped using fluoro after uh, experiencing close to around 200 cases of lung biopsies. It's not, you know, on day one. It's not on day one or not even at 20 cases, 30 cases, after 200, we okay. just want to, having seen the how the Chinese people does it, so why can't we try it? Then uh, I, we did observe uh, for next 20, 30 cases, then we, uh, I find it very comfortable, then yeah. that's the very reason why. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the other thing which I think Bala said and Vijay said and uh, Samir said, all of them said is the sharpness of the tip of the 1.1. You know, that's that's the reason. That's why it's so good for uh, mediastinal lymph node biopsies because of the sharpness. And that's the risk that we spoke about when we spoke about transbronchial cryobiopsies. So let's move on. We've got plenty of questions to ask. There's questions from the audience. So let me come to Chetan. Chetan, um, about the two gases, so N2O and carbon dioxide, uh, what is it do you think is better? Do you think we have a choice? How would you go about selecting between the two gases that we have in cryo today? Chetan. Yes, sir. so initially the options that we had were nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide. But right now, as just some time back, uh, Dr. Balraju said, it is only uh, the RB cryo 2 is compatible only with carbon dioxide. And we don't have any other option. It is just carbon dioxide. And that's the reason it's exclusively used for pulmonology. So this has come... Uh, from the fact that nitrous oxide has uh, airborne, uh, uh, like uh, persistent airborne spread for some time after the procedure. And uh, there were reports of short term behavioral changes and long term reproductive effects of nitrous oxide. And the, uh, uh, at the concentration that is present after the procedure, it is considered hazardous. So that's the reason it is replaced with carbon dioxide, even if carbon dioxide is persistent in like. And then uh, in the environment of the operating room, it is not hazardous. And so that's the reason it's replaced. And currently the cryo 2 pro system is compatible only with carbon dioxide and we don't have any other option. Grand. Thank you. That's a concise. There's no need to summarize what you said, Chetan. So it's carbon dioxide and no N2 at the moment. So we'll stick to that. Let me come to you, Samir. Samir, a uh, question about using different techniques for endobronchial debulking endobronchial techniques together so do you do that so as in you use a cryo with an argon photocoagulation or a laser do you think that's the way our unit should be set up that you use these techniques concurrently or do you think starting off a unit just with cryo and having no other endobronchial technique still serves you okay and you can move forward with that what what what's the choice where is the safety in starting off with these procedures yeah so I have very strong, uh, pretty strong opinions on this. And uh, this also comes through uh, experience. I've exhausted three reusable probes as in I've used them till they stopped working. And now the company is not giving any reusable probes. So the first thing that I've realized is over the years, the indication for uh, cryobiopsy in ILD has reduced. So when we started, most of our cryo cases were for ILD cases and now if you have a good uh, understanding of the CT scan, if you have a good MDD, the chances of you doing a cryo for an ILD 
are very less over the years it has gone down because basically you are not giving a great benefit to the patient in just deciding whether the patient requires a dose of steroid or not the shift now is majorly towards debulking and uh, endobronchial uh, blockages such as mucus plugs and blood clots so that is where uh, the role of debulking has increased and um, as you had asked me i would say that there is no uh, unit which can be only a stand alone cryo unit for every case every case that i'm performing cryo biopsy i have the electrocautery unit ready as a standby and for half the cases uh, they work uh, in a tandem so a patient has an endobronchial tumor the first approach is with either the electrocautery snare or uh, the blunt probe or the knife then followed by cryo for extraction so i would not suggest that anybody should start a cryo unit without a a rigid bronchoscopy unit and a hot therapy which can be either an electrocautery can be an apc can be a laser as of now it is safe to say that the electrocautery will give you the desired result in the cost frame that is available the apc is slightly expensive so if you have to invest you have to invest in a cryo and an apc which is almost twice the cost and laser is something that is mostly you will be having if you have a, a uro surgical unit along with you or maybe if the gastro unit has one of the lasers so as of now i would say you cannot have a cryo unit without a, a rigid bronchoscope and b any of the hot therapy so all the debulking should be must be attempted only with both of them together only one cryo can can land you in big trouble because at times the cases of cryo will bleed they will bleed torrentially and it's always safer to approach any endobronchial mass tumor first with heat and then with cold yeah grand so very nicely put uh, i've got a couple of sort of uh, i'll try and explain a couple of statements that you made a little bit further especially about the ild cryobiopsy so i agree with you sameer that the indication for doing cryobiopsies in ild have gone down i wouldn't say they've gone down radically because i don't think it's just a question about steroids i think it's also a question about the amount of fibrosis versus the amount of inflammation and that tells you about prognostication in these individuals which also is an important part of dealing with interstitial lung disease so i think what you say is absolutely right in principle the fact that you need to balance the risk of doing the procedure with the benefit that you give to the patient but i think there is still a significant percentage of people with ild who would need cryobiopsies and i think we need expertise in certain centers to do these procedures for sure um i'll put this question to bala i'll ask my question in a moment but question for you bala so we started doing cryos about 9 years ago and for the first 4 or 5 years uh, i got deskilled in doing rigids and i did not have a rigid so i did it through a flexible and while we did have episodes of bleeding uh, maybe i my stars were good and i was lucky but there was nothing which was life threatening we had argon photocoagulation we with electrocautery and argon photocoagulation we did manage to control bleeding to a large extent so i think getting expertise in cryo and getting expertise in rigid are probably two different steps you know so i would say that cryo is reasonably easy to learn whereas rigid for people who don't learn it know it is probably two steps further up so your thoughts about something which samir said do you think we should know rigid for sure before you embark on to doing cryo of any description or do you think we can start off with small procedures like mucosal biopsies taking in the bronchial tissue maybe doing thoracoscopic uh, pleural biopsies learning about cryo and its use and then learning about rigid in the long term so that your procedure becomes safer bala um, yeah, thank you sir so i still remember uh, when i was buying my cryo unit that's the this is in 2015 i still i gave you a call to ask you sir should i buy this or not i still remember this so i had the luxury of using the both units because i used the ca unit and also i used the new uh, erbe unit so i have seen the difference between the nitric oxide and the carbon dioxide uh, systems that's what i was uh, uh, thinking about chetan was saying that what i've seen the main difference was the nitrogen uh, the nitric oxide system is much faster freeze time than compared to the carbon dioxide forget about that so coming to the question 
So I always feel the safety is utmost priority, especially for cryo. So to answer your question, sir, uh, yes, I feel that rigid should be the way to go if you want to do a cryo, basically a cryo lung biopsy or a debulking and all. So that's, I feel that's, there's no point in discussing whether should you use rigid or not. There's no point. So, but what I felt was, so even if you want to do all the cases under rigid, so you can't do all the cases under rigid. This is what my personal experience, especially for obese patients, short neck uh, ladies, so it was very, very difficult to uh, uh, place the rigid uh, bronchoscope inside the trachea. So what I felt was, so this was a challenge I faced when I was doing this. Initially, my first case of cryo was without a balloon. Luckily, it didn't bleed. So I learned my lessons. I, I thought that, okay, I'm not going to do without a balloon. This was in 2015 when I bought that system for the first time. So after that, all the cases were under a balloon. But I should admit this, but I did most of my cases with uh, endotracheal tube. But the only one trick what I've learned was to use the balloon outside the endotracheal tube. So do not place the do not place the balloon inside the endotracheal tube. That's the pro problem because you can't use your uh, uh, therapeutic bronchoscope to you do your procedures because now the size is compromised. Uh, uh, the lumen is compromised because of the balloon inside uh, the endotracheal tube. So. The trick what I've learned was to place the balloon outside the endotracheal tube so that now you have the whole lumen of the endotracheal tube where you can pass your rigid, uh, in a therapeutic bronchoscope. So that's the trick I have learned. And regarding to your question specific, should you start doing a mucosal cryobiopsy then followed by uh, all uh, diffuse parenchyma and lung disease? But I, I, I always feel there's a trade-off because... See, even if you want to do a mucosal biopsy initially, because once you run a pulmonology unit, international pulmonology unit, there's nothing like uh, you will get this case first and you will get another case uh, later. Because you should always get prepared with the worst case, I feel. That's what, the safety is the priority. But I always feel that if you don't have rigid and if you don't have skills to do a cryo, probably I think you should be always be safe, learn more rigid then uh, do a cryo lung biopsy. So once you have a good idea of how to perform the procedure, so what are the steps to be taken? What are the tricks to be used? Then I always I feel that uh, you can do without a CM, with a CM, obviously not with a, without a balloon. So at least you can uh, change to an endotracheal tube. So this is what I feel. So even if you want to do a simple cases initially, but I always feel that there is no bargain in safety. Safety yeah. is priority. Yeah. So first, first safety. So for the best safety, what you can get is with the rigid bronchoscope. So once you see that torrential bleed in your life, one case you have seen, and you will not forget that bleed in your life. Sure. So I always feel that safety is priority. Yeah. So learn your rigid skills first. Always and always you can excel in your career. So there is no point in that, okay, today I don't do, tomorrow I will not learn. So I always feel that learn your uh, rigid first, then you can perform your uh, cryolung biopsies. That's what I feel. Yeah, uh, loud and clear. So completely agreed, Bala. So I think uh, what you said may makes perfect sense. And I think uh, the message to the youngsters is that you need to learn the procedure in entirety. You need to learn rigid. You need to learn flexible and then go ahead and set up your interventional unit. I think the challenge we have today, and we've got, five of the best youngsters in the country doing interventions just now is that everyone wants to become an interventional pulmonologist. And if that happens, then excellence suffers because you don't have the load of cases that you would want in individual centers. You know, it's the same throughout the world. If you had a hundred centers, then you cannot justify learning rigid based on the caseload that you have, or cannot justify learning a cryo or APC. And I think that's the importance of having centers of excellence, the centers that maybe Samir or Bala or Vijay talked about, Chetan talked about, Anirudh talked about. I think it's important to have these centers. If everyone wants to do the same thing, then expertise is something that would probably lag behind. I think that's that's one important carry home message. Uh, let me come to you, Chetan. I've got a question for you. So I saw your hand for a moment, Vijay. Was there anything that you wanted to say before I sort of take things forward? No, but I, I just want to uh, express when uh, uh, there was a case, I just want to uh, share it with you all. Um, a, a, a smoker presented with a, a dyspnea, okay, found to have a indeterminate kind of uh, ILD. 
So when we want to evaluate, see, uh, on biopsy and, and uh, transbronchial cryolung biopsy, okay, we, we could identify, though the radiologically there was no emphysema at all, but we could identify both uh, subpleural reticularity and uh, also emphysema as well. So essentially the diagnosis was CPFP. So uh, yes, we have uh, done this case. We have started this, uh, managing this patient for almost one and a half year back and patient is now no more. The CPFE is a very, very rare uh, lung issue. We can diagnose pretty early with the use of uh, uh, lung biopsy. This I want to uh, mention. So um, during that contest where you were discussing about the uh, cryolung biopsies. But, so very rare. That's what I want to um, mention yeah. at that point of time. And coming to uh, Bala's point, see, I totally agree with Bala. So, uh, and Samir as well. It is very, very important to be comfortable with whatever the procedure that you are planning and executing. You should have, um, uh, you, should, you should begin from the end. Okay, in the sense, so what if, if flexible or uh, flexible bronchoscopy doesn't work? You should have a backup of rigid. And uh, if, what if uh, endotr uh, uh, endotracheal tube the, if you cannot place a blocker um, or Kogati balloon besides the uh, endotracheal tube, you should have a LMA in position. You should have a rigid in position. So it's not about one particular technique. We should master everything to become a perfect intervention pulmonology, pulmonologist and to become an expert in cryo, particularly. Yeah, grand. Thank you, Vijay. So valuable comment. I love this comment about the indeterminate category of interstitial lung disease in which you describe CPFE, because that's one category where you would almost always do an IL uh, cryobiopsy if there's no other indication of not doing it. So if there's no definite contraindication, that's one category where you would always end up doing a cryobiopsy for sure. Um, before coming to Chetan, let me come to you, Anirudh. Anirudh, uh, do you think with cryobiopsies, do you think there is no more place for the traditional transbronchial lung biopsies or even the VATS biopsies? Or do you think there is still a position under the ILD umbrella, there's still a position for these techniques? Yes, sir. Of course, uh, there is a, a scope for these traditional biopsy methods. And uh, I think still at most of the centers, the diagnosis uh, has be, is being uh, arrived at by using these uh, traditional techniques only, uh, direct uh, endobank. Uh, uh, bronchoscopy guided uh, uh, transbronchial lung biopsy, uh, bronchoscopy guided uh, endobronchial lung biopsy, and a thoracoscopy guided biopsy without using cryo probes. Uh, I think still, uh, although there is a gradual shift at almost every center towards uh, using more of a cryo biopsy, but still, uh, because the our target yes. is to manage the patient. Sure. Our target is to treat the patient. Sure. So, Anirudh, I'll modify my question. Sorry, I'm interrupting. I'll modify my question. So, I did not talk about thoracoscopic biopsy. I talked about VATS biopsies and open oh. lung biopsies. That's one category. And about your comment about TBLBs, the traditional transbronchial lung biopsies, my question was, is there a diagnosis within the ILD umbrella where you would still get a very good yield using the TBLB and you wouldn't go and do a transbronchial cryobiopsy in these patients was my question. Yes, sir. I still feel that uh, by using the TBLB and uh, by using uh, the other radiological reports and by our multidisciplinary sure. uh, discussion, we can still arrive uh, at a diagnosis and uh, sure. we can manage the patient well. So, sure. Yeah, grand. Thank you, Anirudh. Uh, I can see Chetan's hand. So, Chetan, your question. Uh, yeah. Just to continue uh, with your question. So when you consider the ILD umbrella, there's one diagnosis like which still holds better for TBLV sarcoidosis. You get a good diagnosis and the yield increases when you combine an endobronchial biopsy along with the conventional TBLB. Yeah, so absolutely agreed. So, so I think sarcoid, of course, but think of interstitial lung diseases as two different categories. I'll come to you in a moment, Vijay. Think of it as more central disease in which you have sarcoid, you have chronic HP, uh, and then you have more peripheral disease where you have the UIP, you have asbestosis, drug-induced interstitial lung diseases, etc. And the more central the disease, the greater the chance that you would have a yield 
by using a transbronchial lung biopsy. The more peripheral the disease, the less the chance that transbronchial lung biopsies would give you a diagnosis. And with the refinement we have in HRCT today, I think we know where to use what. The categorization becomes far easier. And I completely agree with Chetan that a combination of mucosal biopsies, transbronchial biopsies, and a TBNA, if there's the scope to do a TBNA, would actually yield your diag uh, diagnostic yield would increase significantly in patients with sarcoid. Vijay. Sir, I just want to uh, uh, ask a question. So with the, uh, with the presence of EBUS TBNA, how many are doing okay, conventional TBNA? One important point. Second point, in the same analogy, so, so uh, in, even in sarcoidosis, if you identify a minute or a very vague cobblestone appearance, if you biopsy with a cryobiopsy, cryomucosal biopsy, the chance of yield is pretty beautiful than uh, uh, doing with a regular conventional post-biopsy. These are my comments, sir. Over to you. Yeah. So I think, uh, I mean, uh, I agree with you, Vijay. I don't disagree with you. However, if you look at, um, so the what Vijay is talking about for the audience is the concept of having crush artifacts when you use a traditional biopsy. And I was going to come to this question, but we'll talk about this now. Um, when you start off doing cryobiopsies, and I don't know what the experience for the rest of the panelists are, the pathologists also have a learning curve in this. Because this sort of, uh, um, you have an ice ball within, the tissue looks frozen. Uh, the pathologists need, need to learn how to look at this tissue to start with. And there's a learning curve even for them when they start uh, reporting tissue which is taken by cryo, be that an endobronchial biopsy, be that a transbronchial cryobiopsy. There's a learning curve for this. However, once pathologists go up the learning curve and have, they've learned, the diagnostic yield doesn't seem to be very different when you use a conventional forceps biopsy versus a cryo for endobronchial biopsies. So you see cobblestoning, like we just said, that people seem to say that using a conventional biopsy is the same as using a cryobiopsy. Uh, I agree with you. I think you get bigger tissue. Uh, it makes you feel happier. I'm not sure why it doesn't translate into an effect when the pathologists analyze it. Um, I have to admit that in sarcoid, when I'm doing mucosal biopsies, I use traditional forceps even today. I don't use cryo for endobronchial biopsies till today. I might use it for debunking, but not otherwise. I don't know if anyone else have any other experience or um, think anything different? Um, Bala, Chetan? Uh, I just want to comment. So there's a quick uh, comment. Uh, so what Vijay was said was ex absolutely right. See, because once you have an EBUS TBN in your hand, you generally don't do a conventional TBN. Yeah. So I agree, 100% I agree with this, Vijay. Yeah. But two main differences what I've seen using because because even I started doing transbronchial lung biopsies with the forceps, then followed by cryo lung biopsy. So we have gone through that era. So what I've seen that was, so the major mistake what I was doing when I was doing a transbronchial lung biopsy was the choice of the forceps. The forceps, what we use is a 1.9 mm uh, forceps. That, that's what we use. And if you look at the literature, so nowhere it is written that you have to use this 1.9 mm uh, forceps. So, so you, ideally, you should use the 2.4, the bigger uh, jumbo forceps. And we don't use it. As, uh, all, almost I have never used it because I only use the 1.9. The, uh, I'll, give, I'll give you my reason because the major thing is like bleeding. So because the more bigger the forceps, the bigger the chance of bleeding. This, the same holds with the cryo because bigger the uh, cryo tissue, the bigger amount of bleed. And second thing, we used to do it on our conscious sedation, the transbronchial uh, lung biopsies with the forceps. But whereas cryo, right now you will never do in a conscious sedation oh. and that too without a balloon. So now you are more prepared for any eventuality, let it be a small bleeding or anything, you are more prepared because you are doing almost all your 99% of your cases under general anesthesia. So there is a balloon there. So there is an anesthesia and you have an airway secured so this is more safer compared to the traditional uh, transbronchial lung biopsy because even I had bleeding while performing transbronchial forceps biopsies, but didn't have a say, torrential bleed, but we had still bleeding. So, so these are the two main differences what I have seen. So that's the reason we have given up using a transbronchial lung biopsies for diffuse parenchymal lung disease with the forceps. 
steps at least you have a better safety profile now because you are more uh, ready to uh, uh, see whatever the complications are coming you are more ready to you uh, 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 target those complications rather than uh, if you have a bleeding then you have to intubate then you get the fogarty balloon inside so all this is ready now so this is the main two differences what i have seen yeah so i'll come to you samir in a moment just as a response to what you said bala so i maybe i am a conventionalist because i have done this for a very long time so when my pre test probability is sarcoid yes. i actually don't do a cryobiopsy in these patients you can do yes absolutely i have seen these patients you know i absolutely. wouldn't actually end up doing a cryobiopsy it, it is just yeah. one, the same procedure of doing a bronchial bronchial right. lava you just right. put a forceps and get a biopsy right. and and your job is done you don't have to take him under ga rigid bronchoscope right. Uh, all the cm and all that stuff is not required so i completely agree with you yeah. definitely okay grand so we agreed on that point uh, samir your comment so if we keep sarcoid aside if we keep sarcoid aside we uh, have uh, seen this happen uh, at another center that the uh, pulmonologist attempted a forceps biopsy and uh, it led to torrential bleeding which was very much unexpected and then we had to intubate the patient so you go for an emergency intubation you go in with a balloon so as dr bala raju said what we are doing is we are taking all the preventive measures before any catastrophe happens so another point that comes handy is you need to be very good with your intubation techniques so when you need to be good with your intubation techniques you might as well intubate the patient with a rigid bronchoscope so when i say rigid bronchoscopy i'm always performing the cryo with a flexible scope it's just that the rigid is used as a conduit there are two advantages there is a wider bore so that the balloon does not get displaced when you come in and go out and second is the patient is ventilated throughout the procedure so either if your patient is having ild if your patient is having an endobronchial tumor if there's any mucus plug there's a fair chance that the lung functions are compromised so during this procedure your patient needs continuous ventilation so this is where the rigid bronchoscope is very handy for the anesthetist for you in comparison if you have an endobronchial tube if, or if you have an lma while you are performing the procedure the ventilation is completely compromised you need to come out quickly and the patient is continued on ventilation and as dr balaraj you said if you are keeping the balloon inside there's a fair chance the balloon will either compromise the lumen or it will get uh, displaced from its original position so the rigid bronchoscope is not a rigid bronchoscopy it's just a rigid bronchoscopy barrel which is being used for a ventilation and as a conduit for the scope to come in and go out and you never know when a patient might start bleeding when it comes to cryo because in principle you are yeah. just using sheer force to tear the tissue away there is no heat involved the cryo although people believe that we are causing a fall in temperature so there will be vasoconstriction but in practicality there is a lot of bleeding depends on where you are taking the tissue and how the patient is so eventually when you are anticipating a bleed it's always safer to have uh, an artificial airway sure so same point well taken i think when you are using shearing force the question of vasoconstriction doesn't arise at all i think the question of vasoconstriction is when you're doing an endobronchial procedure rather than a transbronchial procedure that you think about vasoconstriction etc because of the drop in temperature so point well taken i got a point about so i don't do tbnas either anymore but i think it's unfortunate that tbnas have gone out of vogue especially in training because you will never have availability of tbna in every tier 2 tier 3 town in the country you know and um, even people like myself who have grown up doing tbnas probably have become de-skilled in doing tbnas now so the youngsters the dnb pgts or the md pgts who come today to train if they never get trained in tbna it's almost compulsory that the only way they would end up doing a tbna is by doing ebus which i think is little difficult a challenge but i guess that's just a comment i don't expect a response to it let me come to chetan va quickly chetan um how many cryobiopsies how many pieces how do you go about ensuring that you got enough and do you do different lobes and a, maybe a comment about not doing it from two different sides i'm, I'm tell you this i'm not prompting you but i'm just asking you to convey that message to the audience for us so how many pieces of tissue whether it's different lobes in segments or not and whether it's two different sides or never two different sides 
So uh, we usually go for three to five biopsies, sir. Depending on the size of uh, tissue that we get after every biopsy, we either stop at three or go till five. And depending on the location where to biopsy, uh, HRCT gives a pretty decent idea of where to actually uh, do the sample. And we prefer doing two different segments of a uh, one lobe if it is just a lobar involvement or if it is two different lobes. We prefer doing uh, sampling from two different lobes. Of course, the upper lobe is a difficult thing. Sure. We usually go with the middle and lower lobe. And if it is just a localized disease to a lower lobe, we try sampling two different segments. And when it is too much of honeycombing or a fibrotic pattern, we make sure we don't go into the fibrotic area and we sample an adjacent area where we see some amount of normal lung as well. That gives us a better uh, diagnosis. Sure. And never two different sides is, I think, the message that sort of needs to go out to everyone who's starting to it. Please don't try and sample two different sides. Chetan said very clearly that you're doing two different segments or two different lobes, never two different sides. So um, we've talked a lot about bleeding and control. So maybe a, a quick comment from you, Vijay, about how much you've experienced pneumothoraces in doing transbronchial cryobiopsies and how do you go about screening, looking for them? You said you don't use fluoro. I think one of the advantages of using fluoro is to detect a pneumo on the table, which is something which is possible. So how do you go about screening and what do you do if you get a pneumothorax in these individuals? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rajabai, that's an uh, excellent question, in fact. Uh, so when we see, I started using cryo uh, back from 2017. So 2017, when we started uh, uh, this, in the first one year, we are compiling the data now to publish it. We have got somewhere around 210 to 220 cases roughly. So we are compiling to publish. It's in the uh, process of you know uh, pub publishing. So initial uh, one year, we had a good number of pneumothoraces. Probably I can say six, seven cases of pneumothoraces in the first one year. And then followed by gradually dip. And the past one and a half, two years, we almost never had even single case. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the second important thing is uh, we made it very mandatory for all these procedures uh, wherever we use cryo, particularly cryo lung biopsies, within one hour in the recovery period, post, -op, post procedure recovery period, they get a chest x ray mandatory and then they will be closely monitored for any desaturation or um, uh, signs of distress. So uh, that's one thing we made it mandatory. And then uh, Almost uh, out of probably, if I say ten, if I had ten cases of pneumothoraces, all dozen, all cases um, uh, never required the intervention. As these procedures get um, uh, admitted on a daycare basis, mostly even on ICDs. If they become stable at the end of, you know, after placing an ICD for three to four hours, if they look good and then lung expands again, we discharge okay. them. So, the word which I mean, I am thinking aloud. Yes. So, a lot of these patients or most of these patients would have underlying interstitial lung disease. Yes, right. So, these are sort of firm lungs, you know, so they don't collapse completely and it becomes difficult for them to expand later. No. There's also this question about causing a bronchopleural fistula. Yes. So I think a word of caution needs to be exercised about taking these drains out in three to four hours. I mean, I think don't we think do there's any harm. We take drains in the three to four hours. We okay. discharge the patient, patient with an right. ICD. Okay. To, once the patient is stable on room air, he is maintaining saturations. But again, it is a very, very uh, interesting point which you have made, boy. Um, in the sense, these fibrotic components, which we have to identify in the CT, as Chetan rightly mentioned, the HRCT gives a very good picture of where to biopsy. This is one area where if there is a predominant fibrosis, you, we avoid taking biopsies so that the chance of having a BPF is very, very less, even if patient develops a BPF so, in the post yeah. procedure. So, so I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I think it's important to convey the message that when there's honeycombing, you wouldn't biopsy. But, you know, irrespective, these people have stiff lung. So even if you don't see honeycombing, this is a fibrotic process, but the lungs are stiff. It's a restrictive lung disease and you get stiff lungs. So I think 
with pneumothoraces, even without honeycombing or very little honeycombing at the bases, you still end up with pneumothoraces which are partial, which are mm -hmm. difficult to expand. And I think to ensure that the lungs have expanded post a cryobiopsy, whatever technique, aspiration, drain, whatever you're using, is of utmost importance. And that's that's a message that needs to sort of... As I was mentioning, by uh, yeah. probably discharging, discharging them or for a day uh, with uh, high flow oxygen would be an ideal choice. Most of the times, it has helped. Yeah, grand. Completely agree. I know that we are running out of time. So quickly, I'll come to you. Thoracoscopic cryobiopsies. Is that something that you think, have you done it was the first question. Yes. And second, yes, it's sir. an easy thing to do. It yes. helps. Yes. Yeah, go on. Yeah. It's an easy thing to do. And... Uh, do Actually, sir. Sorry, I said, do you routinely do thoracoscopic cryobiopsies now rather than using the traditional forceps? And do you think it makes a difference as far as the yield is concerned, the diagnostic yield is concerned? Anirudh. Sir, uh, what I observed is that uh, if there are sufficient reasons, uh, uh, on thoracoscopy, then even the uh, our uh, Biopsy probes are uh, giving good results because we can take uh, many pieces, although they are small. Uh, in the reality, we get in uh, by cryo biopsy, we get large pieces, but the actual uh, diagnostic yield, I don't think it differs yeah. uh, whether we do it with the uh, thoracoscopic uh, guided cryo biopsy or the normal biopsy. Yeah, thanks, Anirudh. I completely agree with you. I think that's the message the fact that it does give you more tissue but probably doesn't change the diagnostic key. But we're doing it with the suspicion of malignancy, for example, for molecular analysis, for your immunohistochemistry. I think the extra tissue comes in handy. And using it in those scenarios probably makes some sense. We'll probably have to wait for further data. Uh, quickly, a couple of questions. I'll come to you, Samir, first. Samir, about removal of foreign bodies. So that's not an area we've not spoken about as yet. You spoke very nicely about cryo-resistant and cryo-sensitive tissues. So tell me a little bit about your thoughts about removal of foreign body, if at all, with a cryo -pro. Yeah. So over the years, my practice has majorly shifted from cryo for uh, ILD to cryo for uh, endobronchial growth and either foreign body or mucus plugs. So when we talk about foreign bodies, uh, there's one thing that we need to understand. So organic foreign bodies are basically the right foreign bodies which need to be approached with a cryobiopsy probe. So anything that contains water is your target tissue if you plan to come out uh, with the cryobiopsy uh, probe. So if you have metallic foreign bodies, if you have plastic foreign body, if you have a non-organic foreign body, most probably you would be better off using either the basket or forceps. But if it is an organic foreign body, which in Indian scenario is quite often uh, either supari or any food particle dis uh, dislodged into the airway. So this is where uh, the cryoprobe is very helpful. Uh, it has uh, been uh, shown that it is very useful for uh, any foreign body which has water content. You can yourself instill some water inside the foreign body to get it out with a cryoprobe. And similarly, the cryoprobe is, comes in very handy in an ICU setup, wherein there is a possibility of thick mucus plug leading to lung collapse or blood clots, which are uh, almost impossible to remove with the forceps. So any organic foreign body, any anything inside the bronchial tree which has water inside is the right tissue to be uh, approached with a cryobiopsy. Yeah, great point, Samir. Um, agree with all of what you've said and not disagreeing with your point about blood clots. Just a warning, and I'm sure Samir would agree with me. When blood clots are very difficult to remove, probably the clot is there for a reason. And it's better not to try and remove it in the first place. I think that's an important uh, message for all of us. Very tough, very difficult to dislodge clots are not to be dislodged because they are there to secure hemostasis. So if it's difficult to dislodge, please don't try and dislodge it because you might actually open up an artery which is closed up with a lot of difficulty. So that's just one carry home message for all of you. Let me come to you, Bala. Bala, about opening up of stenotic segments. And I'm asking you this because you're probably the first ones in the country who started doing cryo. Is that something that you think was useful? Do you still use it? Opening up of stenotic segment, the freeze and thaw cycle of 
five seconds. Do you think that works or do you think that's just a uh, hype about use of cryo when it started? It's still, I didn't have that answer till now because I, I still do those things, but I literally no idea whether this really works or not. So coming to the opening of the stimulus segment, definitely no. So right. you want to open the stimulus segment, it's always a heat therapy. That's a cautery knife. There is no discussion about it. The only thing what may prevent is the restenosis. So if you do freeze thaw cycle of the circumference of the stenotic segment, once you dilate it, so you have that uh, idea that, okay, this might uh, uh, decrease the granulation so that there won't be any restenosis. But eventually I had uh, 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 done uh, uh, many cases of uh, freeze thaw cycles after dilatation. I still had uh, restenosis. So... To answer your question, sir, literally, I don't have an answer because I literally don't believe that it will 100% work. Probably in some cases, I don't feel that it works in all the cases. You know, that's okay. not uh, the way forward, I feel. But but if all those the synonic segments are very short, membranous, I don't think they reach to nose again because that's one-stop procedure. Once you dilate them and leave them, uh, they don't reach to nose. But you have them complex stenosis of long segment or a short segment. Those are the cases where you get more and more stenosis, even if you do a freeze thaw cycle. I always feel that it's better to hand out to the surgeon who can do a better job than uh, doing uh, all, all these dilatations, repeated dilatations. Yeah, I agree with you, Bala. I mean, I spent a lot of time back in 2014 and 15 trying to use this for opening up stenotic segments, the long ones. I agree with you. The short ones need to be a diathermy knife or something of a similar uh, nature. But um, I don't know whether they worked or not, but I spent a lot of time doing it at that point and I've given up for the last five or six years. I've never tried to do it again. A quick word from you, Chetan, about what you spoke about so eloquently. So for us, if you can position the transbronchial cryo needle biopsy, not the transbronchial, but the mediastinal lymph node cryobiopsy versus the conventional EBUS lymph node sampling for people who have access to both, how would you position it? in an interventional pulmonologist, pulmonologist basket was the question I was going to ask you. Yeah, sir. Uh, so at least 80% of the times you get your diagnosis with your conventional EBUS TBNA. So uh, the exact role of cryo nodal biopsy is not yet identified, but just like the article we published, we proposed an algorithm where we do a rapid onsite evaluation with a trained pulmonary cytopathologist. And if she feels if the material is either non-diagnostic or inadequate, that is when we pitch in and do a cryonodal biopsy. And if the rose is diagno diagnostic and if the pathologist feels that the material is adequate, we just collect more material for cytology and come out. So, but I think there is more data that is required to where to pitch in this uh, technique and there is no clear-cut guidelines of how many pieces you have to take there is no clear-cut guidelines of what is the activation time so the there are few studies there are three or four randomized control trials so everyone had their own technique to do some people uh, did activation for three to five seconds the first study that uh, came up they activated till 15 seconds also so we did we we are happy with at least five seconds of activation and we see good amount of uh, pieces coming out so at least in our center we do only when the rose is either non-diagnostic or inadequate so sure. okay i can see samir's hand so samir uh, your comment plus there's a question in the question box which asks about the cost of starting a cryo unit today so if you can answer both of them and uh, then we'll take sort of uh, take home messages from everyone we sort of come run out of time so we'll do that uh, so over to you samir yeah so uh, there had been a lot of discussion on this uh, during this ecbip meeting regarding the transnodal cryobiopsy and uh, one conclusion that uh, we have uh, realized is it's better you leave this to centers like chetan and all i myself have performed these procedures in more than two digits but as of now, we are not sure if we are giving any benefit to the patient other than uh, just uh, trying our hand on two technologies which are available to us. And as Dr. Atul Mehta says, you do, you have to treat your patient like he or she is your own relative. So you don't go ahead with uh, experimental uh, strategies. So better leave it with the experts. As of now, there are very, very few indications where your uh, cryoprobe inside the node will actually give you a better advantage compared to a, a, a biopsy 
uh, or TBLB basically, TBNA, sorry. So compared to a TBNA. So as of now, we should we, have, we should wait for the literature to come in and to give us a strong proof where uh, this is applicable. And at times we need to understand where the industry is pushing for certain techniques and where we have to actually draw the line that no, we will do it only when there is a proper RCT and not because it is being talked about a lot. So that is my view. And uh, second is uh, how much does it require to set up? So ideally, the new cryo machine, the Arbe Cryo 2, is something that would cost you anywhere around 18 to 22 lakhs. So that is the cost of the cryo machine. A good rigid bronchoscopy uh, or um, I would say an electrocotter unit will cost you another 2 to 3 lakhs on it. And uh, since you are using the cryo, it is very much required that you do it in not your basic bronchoscopy suite but an advanced bronchoscopy suite or an operation theater where you have the anesthetist you have an anesthesia machine and uh, in case if something goes wrong then you have all the uh, resources available for uh, reviving the patient so all in all you i would say the cryo itself uh, will cost you around 18 to 22 lakh but what you require is uh, basically an OT setup or an advanced bronchoscopy setup, which means a rigid bronchoscope or an electrocautery to go along with it. So, sure. an individual, uh, how much would you, an individual procedure cost once you've set it up, uh, Samir? So, ideally, if you're doing a cryobiopsy, you have to uh, counsel the patient for what I would say is a 24-hour stay in the hospital. So, if you're doing the procedure today, preferably the patient stays overnight. Uh, second uh, is obviously the patient needs to be counseled for either deep sedation or anesthesia. So, that's where the hospital might charge for the OT charges or the bronchoscopy suite charges and a standby anesthetist or an anesthetist who's there for the procedure would charge for his uh, uh, his uh, being there, which is usually 30% of the surgery charges. So I would say a patient would be charged anywhere around 30 to 50,000, depending on the, the city that you are in. So if you are in a tier one city, it might be more than 50,000. But uh, if you are uh, in a center where you are the first one or you are one of the few who is doing this procedure, then you are competing directly with, uh, as we discussed, TBLB or a bronchoscopy watching. So you need to keep your costing according to the patient's uh, profitability. So maybe around 30,000. So a range of 30 to 50,000, depending on the type of center that you are at. Sure. Uh, wonderful. So I cannot see any more questions. Uh, yeah, go on. Sorry, Samir. Yeah. Unfortunately, now we have to deal with the disposable cryoprobe. So there's a huge... Uh, big uh, catch of the cryoprobe itself costing anywhere. So the MRP is 70,000, but uh, anywhere between 40 to 50,000. Uh, the cryoprobes in India are being reused because that's the only way you can actually make it uh, viable for the setup for the doctor and the patient. <coughs> but yes, the cryoprobe itself is costing uh, above yeah. 30,000. Yeah. So that's the message. I think if you are starting off a unit now, you have to take into account that the cryoprobes are disposable. That's a challenge that we need to deal with and we need to go forward. So we'll, I'll come to you, Vijay. I think uh, I cannot see any other questions in the chat box unless other people can. Um, maybe we've explained everything or we've confused people. But um, uh, so before we finish, let us uh, have some closing remarks. There's a question that Dr. Harendra Thakkar has asked, which is, would it be advisable to purchase a cryo unit and start doing it? So we'll sort of encompass that in the concluding statements and we'll maybe start off with you, Vijay, because you had raised your hand. So a carry home message about cryo or generally about interventional pulmonology that you want to tell the audience before we finish today. Vijay. Raja Bhai, before my closing remarks, I just want to you know bring a one very most important point, which with, without which if we uh, uh, complete this session, it would be not you know, called as a complete session. So, what are the measures that we need to take, you know, while placing Fogarty balloon and uh, upper lobe? Okay, I'm sure uh, uh, we all know the things, but for audience sake, uh, on behalf of you, I request uh, Bala to explain, if you permit. No, absolutely. Please. I mean, I yeah. said that actually. Go on. So the, one, the one technique what I follow and which is the most easiest of all compared to all the railroading techniques available so at the Fogarty balloon tip, you just, I usually tie a silk knot at the tip of the Fogarty balloon. 
So once you have a silk knot at the tip of the Fogarty balloon, it's always easy to catch the silk knot rather than catching the Fogarty balloon. Sure. So the problem here is once you catch the Fogarty balloon with your forceps to place it in the one side, one of the segments, there is high chances that balloon get get damaged. So this has happened with me. So that's the reason. Yeah. Just we did all this jugad and tried. Okay, this is what works. And after I've seen this, this is the best technique you can get. You can just hold that uh, knot. the silk knot with the forceps and you can just take it wherever you want upper low posterior segment segment 4 segment 5 8 9 wherever you want you can just take it with you so that's the easiest of all you you have the rail roading technique with the guide wire and uh, passing the fogarty with the guide wire but i always feel that this is the easiest of all even if you slip the fogarty you can always go back and catch it and just put it wherever you want so yeah this is what i've uh, learned it uh, in my practice i felt that this is the easiest of all of yeah. all the techniques so bala thank you i have also me. learned yeah i have also learned something today so i have always struggled with this and i will use that in my clinical practice uh, from tomorrow so you learn every day so thank you for telling us that vijay you were saying something yeah most importantly without uh, uh, placing a proper balloon without the balloon is in position let's not do cryolung biopsy no, i think that's exactly. a point that's that is given, the point which i want to conclude that's my closing remark so that's that's your carry home message for the audience please yes sir okay yes, wonderful so samir's hand up samir whatever you want to say and your closing remark Yeah, so I think so. My hand up was for the previous time, but yes, I'll still I'll still sum it up. So uh, I think so. Most of us who started our procedures during two thousand fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, uh, say for good or bad, but we learnt a lot of things while doing ourselves. A lot of us have published our work, and that has now turned out to be the guidelines. But I would say anybody who wants to a do cryo or anything related to this should. actually dedicate at least 6 months or one year of their training to a certified intervention pulmonology course so i don't know if it was good or bad for us like dr bala said so we have devised our own techniques we've we've gone through putting two bronchoscope inside and then understanding that no an endotracheal tube works better and all as of now if you have any questions if you want to uh go ahead the right way you should go for a proper interventional pulmonology training because if you cannot dedicate these many months to uh and to the art of intervention pulmonology you might as well you you'll end up causing more harm to the patient so as of now in india we have uh, those certified courses so i would suggest that everybody should go uh, and train with the right people and then think of buying a machine so don't don't jump into buying a machine and starting your own unit it's not a cake walk it's not as easy as it sounds uh first go for the proper training yeah so wonderful message yeah. samir i second what you say i think training is extremely important just one point i wanted to add i think the jugad bit probably always remains because the more experienced you become the better you innovate and do things to add on to whatever you've learned with years of training i think that's an important message so the jugad is extremely important but the training happens much before that and is equally important i'll come to you bala i saw your hand um i'll come to you last actually so let me go to anirudh anirudh your message for the audience carry home something that you want the audience to remember from tomorrow today's session uh, my take on this subject is that cryo should be used only when it is required and the safety should be a priority and there should be absolutely no compromise on the safety of the patient even if it costs a lot to the hospital to the doctor or to the patient yeah wonderful anirudh so i think uh, this is a one message that has come out loud and clear i'm so happy that our young pulmonologists interventionalists in the country today are actually putting safety much above innovation doing different techniques i think patient safety is something we need to think about the west has done very well in it and i'm really pleased that together people are thinking about safety far above trying to do new things and innovating and sort of going ahead and doing cut cutting edge uh, technology chetan your message yes sir so i think like whenever we talk about cryo i think the balloon also holds an equal importance be it a fogarty balloon or an endobronchial balloon 
and they are equally notorious we have seen balloons rupturing inside leading to catastrophes so i would suggest always be ready with a second backup option like in our case we always be ready with the dnt tube or we do a barrel in barrel intubation with a rigid bronchial uh, scope and do a isolated ventilation so this came from experience so equally balloon has its place in cryo yeah absolutely brilliant point chetan and to you bala yeah um so i second with what uh, dr anirudh has said that uh, for me safety is priority i i feel that everybody should have that same dictum safety comes first than anything else you want to do a procedure you plan the procedure you select your patient whether he requires a biopsy or not i mean i am especially talking about a diffuse parenchymal lung disease the cryo lung biopsy and sure. i'm speaking about because rest all cases uh, anyway you already decided what you want to do uh, for the debulking or whatsoever or a mucus plug or whatsoever so this is the first thing first is the safety and you choose your patient and two main things i want to just add uh, because uh, dr chetan has raised this point the first thing is the balloon what you choose so what i have seen in this many years inadvertently your fogarty balloon will rupture in first pass or second pass it will rupture the best balloon i have ever encountered is the aunt's bronchial blocker it, that's the best of the best balloon and it is very stiff rigid and it doesn't move around it doesn't till now i have never uh, blown away aunt's yeah. bronchial blocker till now yeah. i have blown away many uh, fogarty balloons and all but till now i have never uh, blown away uh, aunt's bronchial blocker this is what i have learned in yeah. my procedures so if i have to choose a balloon the first balloon is an aunt's bronchial blocker the yeah. first one and second thing i am not very rigid on performing the procedure on a rigid bronchoscope only because uh, this is what i have said because i have many cases where i am not able to insert the barrel inside the trachea so in these cases what i have learned was to place the endo- endobronchial uh, blocker outside the endotracheal tube the best way to do it is again once you tie the silk knot at the tip of the balloon so you just take it and put wherever you want so that's going to stay there Yeah. so after that you just intubate uh, with an uh, endotracheal tube so now the balloon is outside the endotracheal tube and your airway is secured and even if there is a bleed the balloon will take care of it so that's point 2 and uh, point 3 uh, what i want to uh, tell about this is uh, uh, if you encounter bleeding please don't panic so bleeding is a must definitely there will be a bleed please get ready so first procedure or second procedure you do a cryo lung biopsy there will be a bleed please don't panic because always always remember what chetan has said because always have a backup plan get a second balloon or a uh, put a another uh, endotracheal tube inside the uh, rigid barrel so these are the techniques to be a uh, followed so, at the end of the day first is the safety is the utmost priority remember this is a diagnostic procedure this is not a therapeutic procedure losing a patient for a diagnostic pre- procedure is you cannot console the family this is a diagnostic procedure this is not a therapeutic you're not doing anything because you're trying to diagnose what they have so sure. at the diagnostic procedure if you lose the patient you can't counsel the family at all so i always feel that yes you can't uh, finally uh, take away what's going to happen but i always feel that safety you should never compromise right. never 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 this is what right. i always say yeah loud and clear loud. wonderful message um uh, so we'll finish off i mean there's actually 1100 logins or more than 1100 logins today which is absolutely fantastic for a very niche area of pulmonology that we have discussed today and i hope people have enjoyed the discussion today uh, one message from my side and this will sound like an old man but i would still say it i think there are about 850 pulmonologists who are graduating out every year and while it's compulsory for all of you all of us to know the basic diagnostic bronchoscopic techniques you should be able to do a diagnostic bronchoscopy you should be able to do a tblb you should be able to do even an ebus tbna during your training i think if everyone wants to do the techniques that we have talked about today then the expertise that you find on this panel today would have gone and the safety that everyone has underlined probably will no longer be there so going back to what samir said a little while ago i think it's important that people who do this get trained in it and do it very well and that would only happen when there's a bulk of cases and people refer 
to a Bala or a Samir or a Vijay or an Anirudh or a Chetan. If that doesn't happen, then their expertise does not develop and the safety of the procedure gets compromised. I don't think there's any shame in having an expertise in airways disease and expertise in treating interstitial lung disease or doing sleep medicine. That's equally important as interventional pulmonology is. And I'm sure all my panelists on the forum today would agree with that. So there's a lot of variety in pulmonology. Please explore variety. It's not compulsory for everyone to do everything. If that happens, then people will not be able to do it well. So thank you. Wonderful panel. Um, really, really obliged. Wonderful, wonderful discussion. I really enjoyed and learned from it. Um, a big thank you to everyone on CCI. Dr. Krishna, you rock. You came up with this uh, topic and I think uh, Vijay uh, developed on it and took it forward. So thank you guys for coming up with this. And there will be another CCI webinar again next Thursday where you will learn something new again. So thank you, everyone. And uh, we log off today. Thank you to CIPLA for having supported this endeavor as always. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Raja, by excellent moderation as usual. Hmm? Thank you.